Okay, thanks. Um, so, so first we'll briefly explain why we need DNS sec instead of the regular DNS, though most of you people probably already know that. We'll spend some time on, on how it actually works. Um, I'll explain how to use it with bind. Uh, then I'll show you how in the Netherlands there's an experiment going on on how to actually deploy this. There's a shadow system running that actually uh, uh, works fairly well and, and hopefully will be integrated within a year into the, into the standard uh, NL3. And then I'll talk a little bit about the tools on how to manage uh, a lot of DNSSEC secured zones. And in, in part two, after the break, I will talk about Opportunist Encryption, uh, what exactly it is, how you, how you can install it, how you can protect yourself with it. And I'll talk a bit about WaveSec, which is our solution to, uh, to actually encrypt all your wireless traffic, uh, which we'll also be deploying here at, uh, at DEF CON. So if you want to be secure from all the weird people out here, definitely listen to the WaveSec bit and uh, secure your laptop. So one of the problems with DNS is that basically everybody is involved. It's not something you control yourself. You only control part of it, but how people get to you is completely in other people's hands. Um, this is an example of www.freeswan.nl. Um, I've just picked the organizations I found while sort of traveling the organizational view. And we can see that there's a lot of places where things can go wrong that are completely outside your, your own control of your own zone. Um, it starts with the root registry, um, whoever it is today, changes every few months, Internet, very sign, IANA, whoever it is. Um, then we get to the root servers. Um, many people, there are quite some root servers out there. Uh, there are more than 30 now that they're using Anycast. Um, there are a lot of things that could go wrong with the root servers that are generally reasonably okay. Then we get to the, the CCTLD servers where things can go wrong. Uh, in this case, for the .nl, uh, we're talking about the domain reg registry in the Netherlands. Uh, then we get to the bit where um, your packet will have to go through all the BGP routing structures, uh, which unfortunately is not yet protected by any, any good secure mechanism. So packets can get lost there before they even reach your zone as well. And then we finally get to the register of the freeze nl and the reverse space where things can go wrong. And then you get to the, the ISP of freeswan.nl, which in this case is, is actually me. Um, and then we get to the registrant. So in short, I count about 23 organizations plus everybody who can mess up the BGP routing that can actually get to your domain or, 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 or perhaps hack into things be before they get to your server. So no matter how secure you are, um, uh, even if your server's unhackable, before they get you, you're depending on like 20 organizations. So this is a problem that needs to be fixed, and DNSSEC is, is meant to fix this. So this is a, a quick overview of actually a query. Um, I didn't do the layout very well, I'm sorry. Um, basically what happens when you ask for www.freeswan.nl, um, you'll get to the IP 193.1.10.1579, um, and if you look at how it actually works from the start, your laptop uses a file if it's using a caching name server, Ask for as the root servers, which is a hard-coded list. Gets gets a root server. Ask for the the name server for .nl. Gets an IP number. We have some glue. Continues. Gets to the domain registry, uh, which is in Amsterdam. Gets another IP number and some glue. Continues on. Gets the NS record for freeze one nl. Gets NS net nl plus some glue. And then finally, that name server actually has the answer that we want. www freeze one nl is at one ninety three one one ten one five seven nine. So these are about eight questions plus three if you want to verify all the glue that you get to four servers. Um, there are a lot of things where, where, where this can go wrong. So to, to sort of categorize the vulnerabilities in DNS, um, there, there, there are roughly two, two kinds of vulnerabilities. One is the integrity of the data. Has, has somebody actually, is, is somebody messing it up while it's in transit. This is somebody uh, doing a spoofing, fake packets, uh, filtering out, sending other things. Uh, that, that's one part you need to protect. The other part is, 
is the guy who's answering with with uh, to my query actually the guy that's that's responsible for it? Then is he the guy that's supposed to answer the query, or is it just some some weird some weird guy uh, on the block? So um, these are these are some of the things that that you need to secure um, that are, are, are somewhat addressed by DNSSEC, not all of them. Um, first, you have the, the DHCP server in your network. Um, uh, once you get your IP, you have to know that you're actually talking to the right guy. Um, you'll, you'll find out here that that's often not the case. You have to trust your resolver, um, which might be difficult as well if your resolver is half a planet away. Um, you have to trust the communications to the resolver. The resolver has to be secure. And also the name server to name server communication actually has to be uh, secure so that, that if changes are made, that it propagates properly and is protected. Okay, the DNS proofing can actually uh, uh, happen from the internal uh, side, but, but also if a server on the other end of the planet is hacked, it can just give you other answers. If a name server is hacked of whatever, uh, ICANN.org, then, then it, it will just give you valid, query, valid answers, but it might not be the people you would expect the answer from, since they're hackers instead of the real people. Yeah. Okay, um, to the sound technician, apparently on my right, the people have a difficulty hearing me. So, um, but if they can do anything about it, thanks. Uh, I don't think there's much I can do here. From so, what? Any more questions that I missed, or can I? Okay, I'll I'll go on. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go go and ask questions. But you know, if I miss it, okay, just, just okay, okay. So, we have to secure the client resolve for communication. Um, so, if there's a it, I'm sure nobody's here using any resolver that's not on their own laptop. If they are, they're, they're, they're really going to be in deep shit. Um, you, can, you can just not trust any resolver out there. Um, you, the best thing to do is to just run your resolver, preferably DNSSEC aware resolver, on your own machine. Uh, that verifies all the queries because you absolutely have no clue what's being rewritten uh, during, during the time on a network. Um, to secure the communications between two name servers, um, Depends on what you want to do. If, if the zone itself has been secured with DNSSEC, then you don't care too much that things go over the wire plain text because they have signatures attached to it, and you don't really need to further secure it. If somebody would tamper with it, then the signatures are wrong, and you can actually detect it and not serve the data, or the client will detect it and not believe the, the query. So even though it's strictly not necessary once your zones are secure, um, you can, of course, still, still secure it somewhat. Um, but there are other ways to do that as well, and of course you have to you have to be sure that your server is very secure as well that it's not hacked into. Okay, there are basically two ways in which uh, uh, in which you can secure the name server communication, um, which is also used actually for client name server communication. One's TSIG, the other is SIG zero. TSIG works with pre-shared key and uh, was like a, a sort of mini DNSSEC when people started out uh, writing this stuff to secure the name server to name server communication. It wasn't very popular. Most people just secured the IP layer, set up an IPsec tunnel, or actually didn't worry about it. Um, or use SCP to, to propagate those own changes. Uh, so so T6 is not very much in use. Uh, uh, probably it's not very useful, especially if, since it's using pre-search secrets. You definitely cannot use it for client to name server communication. The other one, 6.0, is based on public key cryptography. You can actually uh, uh, use that to secure some things uh, much better. Um, that's especially useful for dynamic updates from your laptop to, to update the reverse tree. Okay, so DNSSEC basically comes with four new record types. The key record, which is the key used to sign everything. The SIG record, which actually contains the signature. The next record, which I'll come back to later, but it's, it's used to, to securely say that something does not exist. And the DS record, which is meant to, which is used to build a chain of trust between parent and child. And there's a new flag in the query answer. That's the authenticated data flag, which actually tells you whether or not the query was resolved securely. Uh, though, mind you, do not use it to, do, do not put any trust in it because it's just a bit and it's not protected by any signature. 
so anybody can set it. So just see it as a debug flag only. So this is the standard syntax of the key record. It's the label first, the TTL, IN, key, then we get the, uh, the, the flags, the protocol, the algorithm, the key material. You can see here this is the key record for FreeSwan and L. Um, you can see it's it, the protocol's DNSSEC. Uh, you can see the key material in there, the algorithm. Um, it's fairly straight onward. Uh, be aware that you can have multiple keys, which I'll come back to as well. Um, the only thing to note now is that um, uh, they've restricted the use of the key record. So um, any protocols you, you're supposed to only use the DNSSEC and not any other value. So it's only type 3 is allowed. This is the signature record. Um, the type, types covered, algorithm, number of labels, original TTL, expiration, and inception of the signature. Um, it's very important that there's actually dates in the signed signature. Um, sorry, in, in the signature. Because otherwise people could do replay attacks. If, if you sign something and, and someone stores that record and uses it a year later, it would be valid because you've signed it if you're still using the same key. So to prevent replay attacks, uh, it's not enough to just have a TTL and expire it. You actually have to say this signature is only valid between this period of time. Again, you see here there's a signature over uh, uh, the two NS records. Um, also, signatures are also based on the type. So if there are two NS records, you'll have one signature over all the NS records. If you have five MX records, you'll have one signature over the five MX records. Then we've got the next record. Um, the next record is basically a pointer to the next alphabetically sorted record in the zone. Why do we need to do this? Um, the problem is if somebody is querying for a record that doesn't exist, how do we tell it like this record doesn't exist with a signature? We basically need to sign our answer. It's not enough to say, well, the record doesn't exist, go away. We need to actually say, here's a, sig here's a signed piece of data that says that the data you asked for is not here. So the way the people came up with it is to actually point to the next valid record in the zone. So if you look in the example, you see alpha.freeswan.nl is uh, uh, the next record that comes after that is gamma freeswan.nl. And the, num the, the, uh, the records that are actually uh, in existence for alpha are, uh, are NS, SOA, NX, SIG, key, and next, which I guess the NS record I should have left out because alpha is probably not the name server for freeswan.nl. So now, if, you, if somebody's asking for beta.freeswan.nl, um, they'll actually get this next record back, which of course has a signature. So the sign tracker then says, you've asked, you've asked for something, and it fell somewhere in between alpha and gamma, but we don't have it, it doesn't exist. So now they know securely that beta.freeswan.nl does not exist. Update from December is that uh, the key record was limited to only use um, uh, the key record for DNSSEC. They decided to split up the key records uh, because they were afraid that there were too many application keys going to end up in the apex of a zone. So they decided to uh, use a different different key type for all the applications. Um, not everybody was too happy with it. Uh, I don't think it's really necessary because there won't be that many keys in the apex of a zone. Maybe an SSH key, an IPsec key, and a DNSSEC, two DNSSEC keys, but that's about it. Um, so, um, yeah, well, the ITF decided on this by um, consensus, so we're stuck with it. Um, so basically, the key records are only usable for DNSSEC. If you want to, if you want to do something else, you need have to make your own application key, which many name server software versions will not support yet or you have to stuff everything in a TXT record uh, and, and use your own format within the, within the text entry, um, which is actually what we've done for FreeSwan. So this is an example zone. I'm not sure if people can, can read it all the way in the back. This is a stripped down version of FreeSwan.nl. You see SOA record, two name server records, an A record for the website, and one MX record. So this is the unsigned zone. This is what it looks like when the zone has been signed. First of all, you see that the entire thing had to be sorted. Uh, this is, of course, because the next record has to point to the next alphabetical record. So first thing you do when you're, when you're signing a zone is actually sort it before assigning all the entries. So you'll see there's a SOA record. There's a signature over the SOA record. There are two NS records with a signature over the NS record. 
There's only one MX record and a signature. Uh, you'll see two key records, not one, uh, with a signature, and actually both of those keys have been used to sign the key record, so you'll see another signature. I'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, and you'll see the next record pointing to www freeze one and l and the signature, and then we see the entry for www freeze one and l and one thing to note is that the next record for the last entry actually points to the first entry, so you see that the next record for dub 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 is actually freeze one dot l the apex again. So now, now we have a secure zone. Um, so now, uh, uh, even though your zone is secure, now you actually have to make sure that people delegate to you properly. Uh, and that has some problems. Um, the parent should securely delegate you to the, to the child zone. However, the parent does not have a key to sign anything. And in fact, the parent shouldn't sign anything anyway for the child because you know it's the child's responsibility. Um, where in the regular DNS you would get a, uh, a non-authoritative answer saying basically, well, go try here and, 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 don't, and, and don't hold me responsible for it. Um, for DNSSEC you have to be slightly more secure. So you have to basically so go there and then somehow we, we will give you a pointer to check where you're actually there. And that's where the DS record, the DS record comes in. What you see here are all the entries for freeze one NL at the uh, uh, the top level NL domain name server. You'll see two NS records, um, and you'll see a DS record, and you'll see that the DS record is signed. So what is a DS record? Uh, the DS record is actually a hash of the key of the child zone put into the parent zone. Uh, the hash is signed, saying that the parent believes that that's truly uh, uh, the key of the child zone. Uh, and you'll see that it did not sign the NS records for the name servers because there's absolutely no clue about that. The only thing it knows is that wherever you end up with, if the hash of that key is the thing that's in my DS record, then you're at the right spot. Sorry? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't really hear the question very well. But it, this is the this is part of the NL zone file, what you're seeing now. So these are the only pointers to freeze one in the NL zone file. Actually, um, there's one record missing, which is the next record, which points to the next entry, whatever, G something. Um, this is what's in the parent. Um, I did not discuss yet how the parent actually knows what to sign for the DS key. That's something that has to happen either out of bound or in bound. Um, there are some protocols for that, but I'll get to that, to that a little bit later. So, so, so once we have this, this delegation in place, um, we, can, we can just chain everything together. So, so the, the NL key in use is actually also signed and, and used by the top level, by the root server, which has a DS record over the NL key um, if, everything, if everybody would be using DNSSEC, um, which unfortunately they're not yet. So we have to come up with a way how to deploy this partially when, when half of the world is secure and the other half is not secure. So the way to do this is to basically say this is a key, this is the entry point for that key, and um, and we trust it from here. I, I see that the key record in the below is actually not very visible. Um, but basically, you have a trusted key statement, which uh, I'll, uh, you'll probably see on the next slide as well. Um, basically, s configuring your name server to say, this is the key for .nl, and we trust everything from it below. So everything should be signed using this as the start of the chain of trust. So one of the problems we then have is, is, okay, so we have a key and we secure everything and everybody trusts our key, but what if something goes wrong? Um, the keys have to be recycled at some point. People can just start some super cluster on, on trying to brute force your key. Uh, uh, we don't want to use too large keys because, you know, we're going to have to do lots of CPU and extensive operations. Keys can, uh, can be stolen from the machine. Uh, lots of things can happen. So at some point, no matter we like it or not, we'll have to replace the keys. So how do we do this? Um, 
the parent needs to be securely informed. Uh, so we can't really automate this and say, hey, this is our new key, go ahead, use it. And then there's also problems with the key records are, of course, cached and out there. So at some point, we need to make sure that uh, uh, if we change the key, that people do not have the old key while they have the new key, and they can't verify the signatures anymore. And one big problem there as well is that you want to, to make sure that there's, there's, there's the least amount of interaction between the parent and the child, uh, uh, especially if it's out of bound action. You don't want every month to, to call up your domain registry and say, hey, I've got a new key. Can you just verify it over the phone with me? So they came up with a concept of, of, of separating the tasks of the delegation. So, 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 so to fix the DS record, uh, to change the DS record, use one really big key that's secure. You don't need to communicate as often to your parent. And one zone signing key for your own zone, which you can just recycle whenever you want without informing your parent. So basically, there are two keys, a zone signing key, which is fairly small, and a key signing key, which is a little bit bigger. Um, these, these bit values are, are it's, it's what's currently used in the experiment. Uh, at time, we'll have to tell whether or not it's, it, it's a good practice. So, so when we have these two keys, how does it work? First, we've seen a normal situation. I've, I've tried to abbreviate it here a bit. Um, the parent has a DS record over the key signing key. And the child has the key signing key, the zone signing key. And then a, the key signing key actually signs the key signing key record, the key signing key and the zone signing key. And then the zone signing key actually signs all the data in the zone. So now, if, you, if, if, if somebody does a query, it will, it will first find these keys. It will, it will find the DS hash of the parent, come to the child, check the key signing key, find the matching hash, trust the key signing key. Uh, then it sees that the key signing key is actually signed the zone signing key. Then it trusts the zone signing key. And once it trusts the zone signing key, it can trust everything signed with it in the zone. So now when you want to do a rollover, you want to change the zone signing key, first thing you do is you have to add the second key signing key. No, sorry, the second zone signing key. Then you sign it with the old key, and you leave it in the zone for a while for things to propagate. And then when things have propagated, um, you just uh, remove the, the old key, and you make sure that you sign it with the new key, and you're all set to go. The key signing key rollover is a bit trickier, because now we have to talk to our parent and say, you have to change the DS on our key. Um, you can have a look at it. Um, um, it's, fairly, it's fairly complex, but um, there are tools out there already that actually more or less automate this for you. Some Perl scripts actually do this. It's a, it's a two-step rollover. First, you add the keys. Then you, you sign it with both keys. Then you make sure that you update the DS. Then you wait a while and remove the old key. So when there's an unscheduled key rollover, um, you basically, w w once, once your, your private key is stolen, you have a problem. Um, um, people, people, th there are quite some operational issues you have to address. Make sure that you're ready if something like this happens. Um, so have an emergency procedure ready. Um, one trick that uh, that's come up is actually put a spare key, key signing key in your zone, which is just signed as a signed piece of data and actually put the private key in a vault, and as soon as whatever your server, your name server, your actually your signing machine is compromised, just delete the whole machine, grab a new machine, grab the fresh key and use that, and just do an uh, talk to your parent about a quick DS change, and then you're all set to go, because the key's already trusted out there. Also, since we're using the trusted key statement in, in, in the name server, um, everybody who uses you as a secure entry point should need to be notified that your key has been stolen and they need to remove that because otherwise they keep trusting the key. Okay, so now how do you actually deploy, how do you actually run and secure your own, your own zone? Um, sadly, the bind development has gone rather slow. Um, so the, uh, uh, you still need actually the latest snapshot from December. Uh, configured with SSL support. Um, if you're using Linux, you'll unfortunately have to disable thread support because it's completely broken. Um, compile and install it. Make sure you're, you're uninstalled uh, the creepy stuff or installed properly over it. Um, if, you want to, if you want the tools to test things, do not use the host command or the NSLOOKUP command. Um, they're really old. Um, if you really like the host output like, uh, like actually I do, that's why I still sometimes use the host command. 
Um, you can use dig plus multi-line, and then you'll get a more or less uh, similar looking output. And you can actually, in the snapshot, uh, there's also support for a dig RC file. You can put this in your dig RC file and just start using dig instead. Um, if you want to check DNSSEC, um, use the plus DNSSEC parameter to, to do secure resolving. Um, if you just want the data without the checks, just to verify that the data is in there, use plus CD flex in your query and you'll just get the data without uh, the checks. Like if you don't use that flag and something's wrong, you'll just get surf failing. You have no clue what's going on. If you use plus CD flag, you don't get surf failing, you just get the data back. And there's one big issue we ran into as well um, at some point. But bind 8 actually is too clever. What it does is if, if it sees that the signature expired or, or the inception date is wrong or your time on your server is wrong, um, it will just remove those, that data from the zone file. So if you start experimenting now, sign your zone for 30 days, uh, then forget about your experiment, then you know, in 30 days from now, if you're running bind 8, your zone will be empty and people will have problems. So either use bind 9 or make sure that your signatures don't expire. No, um, uh, as far as I know, the, the, the only software currently supporting all the DNSSEC and the DS records only bind snapshot. If there's any, any other software out there, please let me know and I'll, I'll test it immediately. Um, but so far, as far as I know, bind is the only, only software out there. Yes? So your question is about how to handle caching of keys? Right, if, the question is, if data is cached, what do you do when the key is stolen? Well, it, it, first of all, uh, 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 apart from the cache, there's also the signature lifetime. So if you keep your signature lifetime low, like say one day, then it doesn't matter how long it stays in the cache, uh, after a day it will be invalid. Um, if you actually use a, a long signature time, then you'll run into the problem that, yeah, if all the, the cache data is out there, then you, you might have a problem uh, only if the, the path of trust is not broken before. Like, even, even if that's cached, if they do a proper uh, uh, check on the entire chain of trust, and you've changed your key, and, and the parent has changed the DS key, and they actually ask for that data, then they already know that there's some other data there. So automatically that what's in your cache is invalid. Okay, so the actual commands to secure your, your zone file. Um, DNSSEC key gen and then the parameters for algorithm, bit size, zone name. Um, you, you'll get some output back telling you what, what, what key number, what key ID is there. Um, the first first command is for, uh, uh, the, the DNS a key gen command doesn't really know the concept of key signing key and zone signing key. So um, you don't see any difference here in the generation of keys. You just see that we use 2048 bits for the key signing key and 768 for the zone signing key. Um, you'll end up with two files, uh, the dot .key and the dot .private file. Uh, obviously, the .private file should be very secure on your own machine, and the dot .key file is actually something you put in your zone. So you could cat the key file into your zone, increase the serial number, and then actually use the DNSSEC sign zone command to sign the key, um, as illustrated there. Um, you'll get a, 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 a dot .signed zone file, uh, which you then up, update, upload to your, your master name server. Um, and then just change the load command to actually load the dot sign zone file and you're running. And you can test it with uh, multi-line DNSSEC command. So um, in, in the Netherlands, this, this has already been uh, deployed in a shadow system by the domain registry. Um, you can go to SecRec NL, NL Net Labs NL um, and uh, this is an example of how you actually talk and create the DS, uh, the DS record at the parent. You basically set up your zone just like we did before. You publish it on your name service. You wait until things have propagated. Then you go to this website and you say, I want to secure freeswan.nl. What it will do is it will do a query for the key record. Um, and you can decide which of the key record is the one that needs the DS, so which is the key signing key. 
you select it, you hit submit. Some email is sent to the proper uh, context that, that it pulls from the Wiz database. Um, and actually, uh, it creates a DS record. And the next day, um, your zone is secure. Obviously, for the people who've paid attention, they've now seen a big problem. But I don't see any hands raised yet. OK. This first query that's being done by the, by the registration system can, of course, be spoofed. So uh, they, need, they need to work on, on, on preventing this. But uh, uh, that's also why there's the extra mail step there to, to secure it. Uh, uh, this is just an example implementation. Um, they need to address things like PGP secure, the updates for, for this. They've also written an application to actually do a key rollover uh, at the parent. Basically, what happens is you go to this web interface. Um, they give you, 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 you tell them, I want to roll over free swan and I'll uh, key signing key. They give you a random record. You sign it with a little Perl script tool. Uh, uh, you, up, you put it in the any box. You upload it. Uh, they check the signature. Then you know that you got the old key, and then they'll replace it for your new key. This is how a, a resolving uh, a resolve query looks and answer. Um, you can use the two you, the two machines listed there to do your your own testing on secure resolving. Um, this machine is set up to accept a queries from everywhere in the world. Uh, so you'll see here a query for um, actually an old example, fnl.nl. Um, one thing to note is that you'll see the AD bit being set. So um, this was actually authenticated data. So this is all fine for one zone. Now how do I handle a, a, a lot of zones? Um, well, there are some standard Perl tools written, the NetDNS stuff. And there are some new new things written, the, the uh, NetDNS SEC, which um, uh, probably uh, the DNS SEC main tools have been slightly renamed in a different hierarchy. Um, uh, it's, it, some of these are, are pre-released by Olaf Goldman of, of RIPE. Um, not all of it is public, but just um, uh, talk to me, and I'll, I'll give you a copy, and you can test it if you want. Um, these tools, these Perl tools actually support all, all the things I've talked about so far. Um, some commands you can use. Main, main key DB is actually uh, a shell. You can just type in everything with, with command line completion and everything. Or you can just type it all on one line, which I did here as an example. So to create a key, you just type that. And it just it keeps the key separate in a separate uh, uh, file structure uh, uh, apart from your zone file. Um, which means that you can easily roll over stuff and, and change your keys without actually having to manually edit your zone file. So, so it keeps your zone and your key separate. And once you sign, it actually adds the two bits together and creates a secure zone for you. Uh, then you run the DNS signer. Uh, and then you, do, uh, you can also do the, the key rollovers. So there, there are some changes in the organization that you'll, you'll need to be aware of. Um, of course, you do not want your signing machine to be in your name server. Um, if, if, you, if you keep all of the secure, all of the private keys on your name server, the next root exploit for bind will still kill all of your extra security. So it's very important to have a separate signing machine, sign the data elsewhere, and then upload it to your name server. And make sure that your name server has absolutely no rights to your signing machine. It should just be one-way communication, which means that even if your name server is completely hacked to pieces, they can only use regular DNS, but they could never use another DNS sec signed zone data to, to hijack your zone. But it's actually a really cool feature. Your name server can be completely hacked, yet still they cannot send you anywhere else. Don't let the sick records expire. Um, if, if you're using complex systems like MySQL databases to, to have customers edit the zone, their own zone, you'll have to edit your own, you have to write your own glueware to actually fit it in. So now we've secured the DNS. Apart from having a secure DNS, how do we? Uh, uh, what other applications are out there? Um, after the break, I will talk about what uh, we believe is the um, real first application using DNSSEC, which is FreeSwan. Um, Basically, it can do opportunistic encryption, meaning that um, it can set up IPsec tunnels based on keys that are in the DNS zone. And then, of course, if the DNS zone is secure, 
then you can you can just spontaneously set up IPsec tunnels to any anyone who supports us in the world without having had prior contact whatsoever. Um, for anybody who's maintaining more than a few static IPsec tunnels, this is really something you want to use because it, it ensures you a massive deployment of IPsec tunnels without having to configure every single tunnel. If you're interested in this, um, come back after the break. Another application people wrote a while ago to test was the uh, OpenSSH support. Uh, basically put the, o the SSH key in the, in the DNS zone and, and support it. Um, unfortunately, nobody's maintaining it. Um, it was written for OpenSSH 2.2, I think. Um, so um, maybe someone can, can convince the BSD people to, uh, to update this. Uh, the DHCP um, software actually has some, some support to, to secure, to, to, um, to send keys over DHCP, which we'll be using for the WaveSec stuff uh, here at the conference as well. Um, if you want to secure your wireless, um, come talk to us and we'll show you how to use the DHCP software to secure your, uh, your, your last mile here. Um, and there's some next, soft, next walking software written. Um, if you remember the next record, um, it points to the next piece of data in the zone. So basically you can sequentially query a whole zone and get the entire zone data. Some people are worried about that, um, especially the domain registries who basically do not publish lists of the entire domain. Um, if you would run this on .com, you would just get the entire .com zone file, you know, all the domains. Um, people don't like that. And there's still no, no browser plugins, no, no mail clients that's, that actively support DNSSEC. There's no POSIX support written or defined. Um, that's something that needs to, be, needs to happen now, but that's not going to happen before people start deploying this on a name service. There's some references here for people who want to look up. Uh, the, right, the right reference is actually a really good manual if you want to experiment with it yourself. Um, these are all on the, on, on the slides. Uh, you, can, you can find it later on. So I'm more or less ready for, this, for the break. How much time is there le is, do we have left? 10 minutes, OK. So are there any questions at this point? None. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll show you my little script that I wrote then to uh, to secure. I'm basically running a copy of our signing machine on my laptop. So if everybody wants all the keys of of us, then they should really try and hack into my laptop. Of course, it's not connected to the net right now. Sorry. So if you see here, um, these are a bunch of our customers, and they have, they have domains uh, in, in separate things. I, what I did is I wrote just a little shell script. I don't like Perl. Um, basically increase all the serial numbers to the current date and hour, and then you'll see that I run the sign command. Um, there's a little bug. I have to do one manually because it's a really big record, and apparently there's somewhere in the Perl tools there's, a, there's a, a bug in it. Basically, to give you an idea of how, how fast, actually how slow all of this is, th these are about 150 domains that's now running. Uh, my laptop is about a Pentium 3 500. Um, one thing I found out that um, I had actually, like, my battery life is really, really crappy. But when I was in a train running this for the first time, I actually found out that there's something that you run out of even before battery power, which is random. <laughs> when you're on a laptop, you really have bad random. So there you see the, the error for the exadine at the null zone. Um, that's the only. It, there's a really big TXT record we use for the open source encryption, and it, it can't really sign it. Now you see it's starting to sign all the zones. It's actually much slower than it normally is. Oh, there we go. So no questions. Then we're going to have a slightly larger break. Um, so if people, if people are interested in, in setting up DNSSEC and IPsec tunnels to secure the wireless, um, I'll, I'll talk to about the opportunistic encryption bit after, after the break. Thanks. Apparently, um, there are now more microphones, and you should be able to hear me a little bit better. Uh, if not, just let me know. Okay, so now part two, opportunistic encryption. Um, the reason I personally got interested in DNSSEC is that 
um, I really want host to host and encryption. Uh, just I basically want IP to, to basically standardize to IPsec. I want, I want everybody to talk IPsec. And no way we're going to do this with manual configuration. So we have to have something that just works automatically. Um, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to put keys into DNS and use that to talk securely. And of course, we can trust the DNS because we just secured it. And we, we will deploy this here uh, uh, during the conference uh, in, in the, in the WaveSec way as well. If you, if you have any questions on how to use this, do come to me. We really need to deploy this as soon as we can. Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly talk about the, the, the basics. Uh, what's OpenSense encryption? How you can protect your network with it or your servers? Um, how to install and configure it? Um, the configuring part should be really easy. We've done our best for that. And then uh, we use an example implementation on how to uh, use OpenSense encryption to protect your wireless. So, so IP second in a nutshell um, is basically it, it consists of two parts. First. We're going to get a private channel that we're, we're, we're sure that we're only talking to one guy and not, and not three guys in the middle. And once we know that we're talking to one guy using the Hellman key exchange, we're going to actually ask who this guy is and if he can prove that he really is who he claims to be. And that's the part two thing. Of course, um, as you might guess, we're going to use DNSSEC for that part. So to quote myself, the goal of opportunistic encryption is to have IPsec connections without prior arrangement to exchange information with parties you've never knew before, allowing mass deployment of computers on the internet to talk securely and privately. This will mean that any, anybody who is going to eavesdrop will have to do an active attack on you instead of a passive listening attack, um, which is much, more, much easier to actually find out. Uh, also, for um, we'll end up with servers who do not know how to how to do opportunistic encryption. So there's also a way how to uh, we can just add a server that will uh, do it for the other other people that don't know it. You can actually use an OE security gateway to protect, for instance, your Windows Server Farm. So. So, so one of the things to prevent a middle in the middle attack is to, to actually have a third party you can trust to, to get the information from. Uh, we'll use DNSSEC. So how does this work? First, um, we're, going to, we're going to put a special record in the reverse tree, uh, in the DNS tree for our, our IP number. Um, the example that you see here is the key from my desktop at home. It has 193.1.1.10.1.5.7.17. Um, and it says in a TXT record that says I can do IPsec, opportunistic encryption. Um, my gateway is this and this IP number, which is this, uh, the machine itself, and then the key follows. Um, and of course, this is signed by a, 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 a signature record. Um, the DHCP server and client, both if. if the ISC server actually supports some of this, some of this stuff, sending it back and forth to actually establish this. Even when I'm, I'm, I'm turning on my laptop in this network here, um, I will get some random IP and I can actually update my reverse. Um, it doesn't partially work here because we're in NADD, but we've worked around this by tunneling our own slash 24 in here. So people actually get WaveSec up and running later on, actually have a real IP. So if both if both parties have the key in the DNS, they can they can query it and set up a tunnel. So, not you you don't always control your reverse. Um, actually, most of us do not control our reverse unless we have servers. So, we had to come figure out a way how to do this when you when you have no control of it. So. Um, we can't work around it. There has to be one guy in the connection that actually controls his reverse and have something in there. Once you have that, the other guy can just have something in the forward. So, I guess I'll go wait for the plane. So, so what, what we can do is we can put our key in a forward. Um, this example here shows my laptop, VIO XDNet NL, which has a key in a forward. Um, 
in this case, we don't point to a security gateway uh, because we don't know which IP we are. So the entry right now is 127.0.0.1, which basically means ignore me. Um, and again, I put my key in the DNS. Uh, XDNetNL is signed, so it's pretty secure. So um, now, um, if, if my laptop boots in, in a random network, gets an IP, and I go talk to my servers at home, which, which have all the support for you need it, I just tell them, hey, I'm, I'm via XDDNet, and I'll grab the key from the DNS, and then we can talk securely. Uh, so one, one thing to note is, is that um, actually if, if, if I turn on my laptop here and my server for some reason decides to talk to me first, my server does not know that I can do opportunistic encryption because my IP does not advertise that. So it will send a packet in the clear. Um, once I get it um, I, I, and, I, and I send an answering packet, then of course I will notice that the remote server can actually do OE and set up OE. But it's a really odd situation where one packet actually flows in the clear. So, so one problem of opportunistic encryption, of course, it takes some DNS lookups. And for some servers, that's really too much of a load, um, especially busy web servers. So there's a way to actually do only passive OE, which means that um, do not try to initiate OE to everybody who connects to you. But if somebody connects to you using OE, then sure, let's go ahead. And this is actually what, uh, uh, what we use on, for instance, the freezefund.org website. Uh, if you go there, if you don't have OE, you will just get the server. If you do have OE, you'll get a nicely crypted secure channel. So we're going to use so this is a form of OE to protect the wireless. This is a diagram of basically what we're setting up here at the conference. Um, we've got the, the internet. Uh, we've got our locals, uh, local network. Uh, we've got our laptops. Um, we use we send a DHCP request that actually contains uh, our key in the request. Um, the server, our, our own DHCP server, which we added to this network, um, sees that somebody is asking for OE, and it will next to the regular DHCP server also send an answer, say, sure, you can use this IP number, um, and actually you can use this WaveSec server to do opportunistic encryption, and. Uh, my client, my laptop will receive both of these DHCP answers. I will prefer the opportunistic encryption one. Uh, uh, it will get the key from the DHCP server from the answer as well, um, and has both keys to start initiate a connection to the WaveSec server. Once it initiates the connection, the WaveSec server, which while it, when it gave the IP number to the laptop, actually also put the key it got into the reverse. So it actually knows the key as well. So it knows its own key and the laptop's key. Uh, so both parties know, know both keys, and they set up an IPsec tunnel. And my laptop will tunnel the default route through the tunnel, which means that even if I'm talking from my laptop to another laptop within the same wireless network, I'm actually talking through tunnels. There were some people who, who did a man in the middle attack on the, the DHCP part. Um, if they are somewhere here, I would definitely like to talk to them. Um, uh, the, because I, I just heard about this like a couple of months ago about the utility air jack which actually plays a man, I think a man in the middle DHCP server. Uh, so it's really interesting to have the, those people talk to me. Um, and to answer those people's problems with it, how do we defend against this? Against this? Um, well, the good news is that the DHC working group at the IETF decided to use DNSSEC to secure the DHCP. So once, once those standards start, start getting used, um, we actually have a sort of trusted way to do DHCP, and this man in the middle attack is no longer possible. Uh, for now it is, so um, um, if these people are here, I would really like to see my laptop being a victim of this. So, so most, most people at home have like, like one IP number, um, and they often uh, ask us, like, can we use opportunistic encryption? It doesn't work. Um, actually, it does work, but you have to be very careful in how you set it up. Most people do NATing on the external interface because it's easier to configure just anything that goes external NATed to this IP number. However, if you're doing IPsec, IPsec is meant to protect packets from being rewritten. So actually, you cannot rewrite those packets. So you have to be sure that you're using NAT on the internal interface at home so that you first rewrite your packets to your external IP number, then use IPsec to continue to talk to the world. 
and probably you won't control your reverse of your, your ADSL or cable modem provider either, so you have to use the initiate only version of operating system encryption. The, the IPsec world, at least in the, in the Linux world, IPsec has been rather, uh, uh, we've had a rather interesting two months. Um, uh, to make the political issue really short, the people who wrote FreeSound believe that uh, uh, decrees from their government that do not go through the parliamentary process was, was a problem. Uh, basically, the US government can, can kill export of crypto at any time. Therefore, they did not want US citizens to write the code so that the US government could never claim any full control over it. Um, the Red Hat people, being mostly US citizens, didn't like that. They wanted to fix bugs if they could, so they didn't include FreeSwan. So there was this stalemate that happened for a couple of years, which is now basically being broken by, by the Red Hat kernel people by basically making their own IPsec uh, stack. Um, we're, we're talking to them, we're hoping that, that we can keep everything working. There are patches out there which should integrate really quickly in the next couple of weeks that makes all the, the extra opportunistic encryption hooks that Freefund put in the standard IPsec to also be part of the new Linux uh, kernel IPsec stack. So everything I'm saying here should work for either either stack, whether you use Freeswan or whether you use, use the, the, the new kernel stuff, it should just work. Uh, and hopefully it also makes porting it to BSD a lot easier. So, so what do you need to, su to support the extra opportunity uh, encryption uh, extensions? First of all, the, the kernel part, which I just talked about. Second, you also need to have some support to do the DNS lookups once you get packets to see if you can actually get the keys from DNS and, and start things from there. Um, so far, the only, the only IG daemon that's supported is the Freeson Pluto. Um, Hopefully this will also soon change and then some support for Raccoon will be added. You, you need to have at least access to one forward zone to put in your key so that you can do initiate only uh, open disk encryption. Uh, preferably not some, some dynamic DNS thing, but like a, your real own zone, which would be a lot better to use. Most people who want to experiment with this actually have one zone, so it should be fine. And um, if your ISP is going to filter out a lot of stuff, then you're, you're, you're in trouble. Um, you should have IC ports open, UDP 500 mostly, and, and ESP. So how does the operating system encryption work technically on, on, on Linux? Um, basically, all, all of this predates NetFilter and the 2.4 kernels. This was written for, for like the 2.0 kernels, so there's no, net, no nice NetFilter hook-in. Basically, what happens is we wanted to catch all the packets before they go out so that we can do crypto on them and see if we can actually set up a tunnel to the remote end. So we need to catch all packets. If we can't get a tunnel, we just pass them through. And if we do get, if we do get a tunnel, we just first set up the tunnel and then fling them through the tunnel. So how do you catch all packets? Well, the Freeshawn people came up with a really clever idea. Just grab the default route, cut it into smaller parts so that their the preference is higher, uh, and, and grab all the packets. It's the two green lines you can see in the, in the route command that says, you know, the first half of the entire ISP space, fling it into the IPsec device, and the second half of the entire IP space, fling it into the IPsec device. So basically, you've replaced your default route with a more specific default route. For people who don't use the IP command, this is the old route syntax. So then, of course, we need to we need to sort of know what's encrypted, what's not, what's the problem. Uh, uh, do we have a tone to the other end? Um, I've, I've tried to put all the states in, in, in one picture here. Um, first, you'll see that that my desktop is running OE on, on the first line. It says trap all packets going from this IP number to anywhere, which means trap the packets, see what we can do with it. The second line, you see a pass E route. This is what, this is what we call an E route, an encryption route. So a pass here, a trap means do something with it. A pass means we cannot do crypto with it, just let the packet flow. Um, the tunnel actually means we've set up a tunnel and the IP listed on the right side is actually the gateway. Uh, remember, if you do OE, you can also do OE to another server. So 
if you want to protect like like a Windows farm with a Linux box, then basically my laptop would set up an OE connection to the OE gateway to the Linux machine there, and then it would decrypt and be sent to the Windows farm. So on the on the third line, you can actually see that dot seventy seven is the security gateway for dot ten, and uh, my laptop has a connection to it. So packets from dot seventeen to dot seventy seven are encrypted. They're decrypted by dot seventy seven and sent to dot ten. We see another pass route, which is to my name server dot two. Um, and we, we see the next one is a hold route. This is an interesting one. Hold basically means we determined we can do crypto. We should have an, an IPsec tunnel up, but for some reason it's not working. So we don't want to fall back into the clear because this guy obviously advertised that he can do crypto. So something's really wrong and we just don't want to send packets. So hold the packet and until the situation gets fixed, do not send anything in the clear to this guy. And the other two are just more examples of uh, established tunnels. So to, to refine this, this a little bit better, uh, FreeSwan starting from version 2 supports something called the policy groups. Uh, it makes things a little bit easier to say, you know, okay, this guy's been misconfigured for so long. I know he advertises he can do crypto, but he really doesn't. So I just send it in the clear. And you can just put him in the clear file. And then it will just always work, always send clear. Or you can do it the other way around to say, no matter what's being advertised, you know, my own super secure network should always be crypted, and if not, just ever, just completely block it. Or uh, which which should be your default is, you know, try to be private. But if that fails, yeah, it's okay to do it in the clear. So how to install install FreeSwan? Um, most distributions actually already have FreeSwan support. Debian, SUSE, Mandrake, Connectiva. They all have binary RPMs you can just install. Um, because the political issues, Red Hat doesn't have uh, binaries yet. Um, we just make uh, 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 binaries for all the RPMs that Red Hat ships. So if, if you want to just install binaries, you can just go to the URL mentioned there and install it on your Red Hat machine. Um, every time Red Hat comes up with a new kernel, we make matching modules for this. Or you can install it yourself from source. So if, if you really want to install it from source, um, just grab the software. Make sure you have the GNU met, uh, mathematician library installed, GMP devil. You need the header files. Um, build the, build, make sure that you build the kernel. Most people come to us when, it, when they can build it and they have other problems because they're using a Red Hat kernel, they're using another kernel, something doesn't work or actually the kernel just doesn't build itself. Um, first build a standard kernel, then apply the FreeSwan patches. Um, there are various ways of doing it. If you just want modules, you can do make old go, uh, which will just use the same defaults you just used on your previous build on the kernel, just add the IPsec stuff as modules. Um, for some people who want to next to OE do other things like net traversal, even though net traversal with OE doesn't work yet, um, if you if you need net net T support net traversal support, you also have to 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 the, there's a patch the ESP and UDP patch which actually patches the kernel itself, not any modules. So you actually have to build the entire kernel, not just the modules. But for for just OE, this is not necessary. So for for two five, we've, we've the last few weeks we've been playing with it. Um, um, there are definitely a lot of bugs that needs to be fixed. But for the for the alternative IPsec stack, it it, it sort of works. Um, basically, make sure you get the latest patches and just build just build the user land with make programs and don't build any kernel stuff. So one, once you've installed it, um, if you if you haven't installed it by RPM, which will do most of these things for you, you will need to create the DNS records needed for the operations encryption. Um, you can first you, you generate your secret and your, 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 your host key uh, with the command listed there. Then to make it easy, if you just use the IPsec show host key minus minus txt and then the IP number, that's your security gateway, um, you get the entire uh, DNS record that you need to give to whoever's the maintainer of the key or the forward, so the reverse or the forward zone. So we make it really easy to just cut and paste your key. Do, do cut and paste it and not edit it, because many people make mistakes when editing it. 
Uh, there's some, some issues with spaces and bind that are really annoying. Uh, for, for people who directly run a pest to their ISP, you can use the IPsec mail key command. You can just directly send it to your ISP and say, give me this record. Though, though for, for Freesound 2, we've made it even easier to use OE. Freesound 1.9 is what's shipped on most of the distributions. So I just put this in here. This is the only configuration you need to actually get an opportunistic encryption tunnel set up on once you've installed the binaries. You make a connection called me to anyone. You basically say, um, my outside world, that you use the interface of my outside world as the interface to do crypto on with the leftist default route. For the right, we say, do opportunistic encryption, do authentication by RSA SIG, um, and just start this connection. Um, this will use the OE based on the IP number, so on the data in your reverse, so that if the other side queries the text record for your reverse, it will work. If you're doing the initiate only one where you actually have your key in a forward, not the reverse, you need to specify the left ID. Um, and then you need to specify to add and then fully qualify domain name where the record can be found. Um, the left ID then gets used in the IIC negotiation. For Freesun 2, uh, we basically configured everything for you. Um, it's basically, we just try every few seconds to see if there's the proper DNS records for us to use. And if it is, we just use it and we just try to do OE. Um, so the only thing you basically need to do is install it, mail the key to, to whoever can put it in a DNS zone file, and that's it. You're all set to go. There's nothing you need to do. If for some reason you want to disable it, you can you can do auto is ignore to, to stop that connection. Um, if you use the initiate only version, unfortunately you need to redefine the connection yourself and add the left ID bit again. So now to the what I think interesting bit. The WaveSec, now if you want to deploy if you want to use WaveSec here and encrypt your local traffic, what do you need to do? Uh, first you need to get um, a patched version of the DHCP. Unfortunately, the, the IUC DHCP developer, Ted, has been very busy and is not really maintaining it. And he has these two patches from us waiting for half a year and he still has to apply them. Grab the patch, recompile uh, your DHCP server and client. Um, add the configuration listed below, which is just, it's, it's a file you can download from the, uh, uh, from the WaveSec org site. So don't worry about it. You need to set up a DNS so that the DHCP server access permission to change the DNS records for the reverse so that when it gets a key, it also puts it in the reverse tree. Um, you need to know how somewhat how dynamic DNS updates works. Um, check the URLs below or grab an example configuration again from the WaveSec side. Since, since you, you, the, the WaveSec servers actually need to do crypto on multiple interfaces, um, you specify the interfaces. And so instead of using the percentage default route, you specify whatever interfaces they're in use. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, we still need to define every single connection for on the WaveSec server, which means that we have to predefine everybody who can connect. So for a slash, for a slash 24, you actually have to make 250 connection definitions. Um, we're working on making this uh, nicer, doing it in a nicer way. Well, one problem you have is jump starting. How can you do DNS sec, or how can you do lookup keys um, when 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 you don't have a tunnel yet, or when when you're negotiating the tunnel? So um, the easiest way we found is to just let port 53, the DNS, and and, and the ICMP. Uh, and the IIC negotiation packets just flow through outside of the WaveSec tunnel. These are the, the, the IP tables rules actually do that. O otherwise, y your connection attempt will be stuck in another connection attempt and you won't get through. So for FreeSwan as a client for the WaveSec machine, um, you also have to get a patched version of DHCP. If you're, if you're running Red Hat, make sure to delete the older client the uh, DHCP CD, so that is not in their way. Be careful that the lease files are stored differently, so make sure you delete all the lease files. Uh, for older versions of Red Hat, you need a patch to the ifup script. Um, Red Hat 9 and some of the, the betas before 9 actually support DH client, but just don't install it. So once you've installed it, 
you can just uh, use the standard scripts. And uh, we need to configure the DH client to actually do all this OE stuff. So once you insert your card, DH client gets started and it actually starts to, to set up the WaveSec connection. We do that by using a dhclient.com file. Um, some of the stuff is generated for you automatically. Just use the command ipsec shaholsky minus minus dhclient and put it into your dhclient.com file. Uh, stuff, stuff should also work for FreeBSD and Kame, um, though it needs a lot of manual configuration still. Um, if people want to try it, uh, come talk to us uh, for these specific details. Um, also, of course, uh, Microsoft Windows would be really nice to, have, to, to support as well, except that they cannot grab the keys from the DNS and then use that. So um, we have to figure out something else. We're thinking of doing something here with X509 certificates uh, and X509 patch to freeze one. Um, um, if, we, if we find out something, then we'll put it up on, on the WaveSec box. Uh, again, talk to us if you, if you want to experiment with Windows. Um, we, we think we should have something running in the next few days, but we don't know for sure. So how do you test your OE setup? Because w one of the important things, if it doesn't work, if you set it up wrong, you will just have no connections to the world. So there are many common mistakes people make. Um, we try to catch them in the command IPsec verify, which verifies your, your setup. Um, this is an example where you see that the key has not been put into the DNS. Um, we, we check for some common mistakes, like um, uh, is IP forwarding enabled if you have two interfaces? Um, if you're using NAT or masquerading on the machine, uh, are we sure that we're not destroying the IPsec packets? Um, it's generally a good, good test run to see if it works. Another way of testing OE is actually c go connect to the machines that support OE and see what they tell you. Um, there's one machine currently which is called Untappable XDNet NL that actually has all the DNSSEC support as well. So in the example that I show here, I have, I have connected, I've pinged the, uh, the machine, and then I tell net to the Gopher port, and the Gopher port just gives me all the output. And here you can see that um, I actually had, when I did this, I had the, the IP number of 192.139.4638, and I was actually in a properly signed, DNSX signed um, zone file. And so that machine knows that my RSA identity that was put in the key in DNS actually came from a secure DNS. If you just browse through untappable XD internal, it actually tells you whether you came in through OE, whether you're coming in plain text, or whether you're coming in using OE plus DNSSEC. Some other test sites that uh, should support OE. Um, uh, more and more sites are using it, so uh, this, this, this list will become longer. So there's, there's still some um, problems that, that people run into when, when they use OE. The, f the, the, the first problem is that once you start OE um, and you want to set up a tunnel, you need to do a DNS request. Usually that DNS request starts the initiation of yet another tunnel. Um, so for, for a few seconds while you're, you're not able to actually go to your DNS servers, um, everything will fail. Uh, and you need to hold. You need to wait for that failure to be complete. And once there are pass routes to your name servers, then suddenly all the other connections can actually be set up because then you get DNS answers. So don't don't. Once you start pinging, don't don't worry when it just doesn't work immediately. Just check your log files and uh, and see if it works after a few seconds. Um, freeze run still has some problems integrating properly with the scripts from various distributions when a card, a laptop PCMCA card is inserted and removed. Uh, we're working on, on getting that better supported. Uh, people also often make mistakes in, in getting the keys into DNS, like I said. Spaces, there are some spaces in the, in the text records that work around a few bugs in older versions of bind. Um, uh, but people tend to either not, not grab them or leave them out or, or mispaste them. Um, so be careful when you're cut and paste. Another annoying bug is that um, apparently there's, there's some issue. If, if the each client is run from the command line, everything works. But if, it's, if it comes from a kernel-generated event, 
uh, like like the hot plug stuff when when you insert your card. Um, on some machines, for instance, my laptop, we're getting errors on P open and P close, which we haven't found a reason for. Uh, and due to the, the update on the IETF use of the key record, we had to change some things uh, since we're officially not allowed to use the key record for IPsec anymore. Um, so that change went into freeze on 201, which means that 200 cannot talk to 201 servers. So if you're running older servers in OE, make sure you at least use 201, which knows how to talk to older machines. And um, problems we've also seen is, is people who have just too many tunnels inside each other and then you get either fragmentation or MTU problems. Um, if you run into that, and it especially happens when you have like PPP over Ethernet or ADSL tunnels or PPTP stuff, usually when you're provided those really yucky things, um, make the packets a little bit smaller, usually the problems go away. So for, for like, we really do our best to generate a log message that actually makes sense for every single event that happens. So the, the log files are really to the point when they point out an error. So really try to check uh, your log messages. Um, um, it, it's really in there what's wrong. Uh, run the IPsec verify command as showed before. Um, uh, disable all the firewall rules to make sure that your firewall is not blocking packets. And if that really doesn't help, you can you can use IPing to see if your ISP filters uh, UDP 500 to prevent you from running IPsec. Make sure to stop freeze run when you do that, because otherwise freeze run will grab the, the the port. And if all of that does just doesn't give you the right answer, um, there's one thing you can do is that's run the command IPsec barf, which will basically point will put all the state of your IPsec subsystem except for your private keys. Uh, uh, on your screen, and if you just put that on a website and ask people on a mailing list or the IEC channels, um, they will they will look through it and and they can probably see what the problem is. Uh, one very important thing to do: people see the clips debug and the plural debug variables and and enable that. Um, then those people are posting you know 10 to 15 or 20 megabyte files with debug information that the people helping you on the IEC channel really do not want to read. The debug functions are only for developers, so uh, uh, please do not use them. It's not going to give you more information that you need. So um, if you want to try out OpenDisk encryption, if you want to uh, try out the WaveSec, grab either me or Ken Bentoft here in the front. Um, uh, we'll be gladly helping you set up uh, your, your IPsec tunnels and secure you from all the evil hackers here at the conference. So. Um, but I hope, I hope people will, will see the value of end-to-end of -end host encryption uh, and see that OpenDisk encryption can really reduce the administration task of setting up a massive amount of tunnels, whether it's inside your organization or uh, just to, to out to the world and to the internet. Um, we, we hope that BSD will, will soon support this as well. We're talking to some people. and. Um, so let's hope that basically in the near future everybody is talking encrypted and we're all safe from evil hackers or evil governments. So it, are there any questions? Then I guess I end early. Okay, thank you very much.